Uh, do you see uh, there's a, uh, you can see there the graph AN for uh, what size is it? It's, uh, can you see the edge is five, right? The edge of the triangle is five. Uh, so that is AN at level five. Let's try this. Ooh. So here, you can see the AN, the graph AN here over SL3. So this is mathematics over SL3, one, one higher than usual. Yes, and uh, uh, you can see here an exceptional, the first exceptional, uh, these are on level five. What it means is that here you have the trivial representation, which is of degree zero. And then as you go, you have degree one, two, three, four, five. Yes? Uh, the corresponding Coxeter number is the edge of the mirrors, which you don't see here, but they are at distance one. Yes? So the vertex would be somewhere here. Yes, and uh, that would be for SL3, that would be five plus three, eight. Yes, so here we are at the eighth root of unity. Uh, so at the eighth root of unity, this, uh, uh, so these are young, uh, young uh, uh, diagrams here, which are not uh, drawn, but you could imagine them. Uh, these have uh, here five, five uh, columns altogether, yes? So this is a single dot. These are two horizontally, three, four, five, yes? If you think of representations, the left line are the symmetric representations. Yes, on polynomials in variables, uh, uh, in three variables, E1, E2, E3, right? So uh, these, the left, the left uh, line, and here you have uh, a double thing. So they are polynomials in, uh, if you want, in V bar, uh, which is uh, which is V wedge V for SL3. Yes, remember V wedge V has uh, has a basis uh, E i wedge E j. And uh, by Hodge duality, you can uh, map that into the missing EK, or use as in physics the totally anti-symmetric uh, tensor uh, on three coordinates. Yes. So, so, uh, so these are Young diagrams, and at the eighth uh, root of unity, uh, the. Uh, the things with more than, uh, than uh, I mean, degree bigger than f uh, five would be, uh, would be killed. Uh, what do you think happens about the dimension? Since they're killed and we are at the eighth root of unity, they have an what in their dimension? They have a factor which is, so we are at the eighth root of unity and these things below are killed, yes? They would have exactly a factor eight, yes? In their dimension. Remember the Weil, uh, the Weil formula for the dimension is that the dimension is a product of the distances to mirrors. 
Yes, so let me uh, write it here, maybe sketch it a little bit. So you have here, this is divided into one, two, three, four, five. Yes, and similarly, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, so, so this would be here the empty, and this would be one, two, three, four, five. And uh, the mirrors, the vial mirrors, are here all around. This is a vial vector rho. Uh, these are the fundamental weights. Yes, and, uh, and here, if you were here, then the this, you see the mirror, there's also this mirror. And if you are here, then the distance uh, to this mirror would be as we just said, would be eight, yes? You see five plus here another two, plus another one at the bottom, right? So this distance, let's write it here. This is N is equal to the Coxeter number is equal to eight, yes? Is equal to five plus three, which is eight, yes? So uh, the, the elements, the, the representations here would have a factor of eight. So remember the uh, vial formula for the dimension, the dimension of rho, uh, rho i is equal to the product of the distances from i to mirrors. over the product of the distances from the uh, zero to the mirrors, from the, uh, let's put here the empty set to the mirrors. This is, uh, this is this young tableau. And uh, very good, so. And you can see here the product structure that I was mentioning for the, so once again, this is a graph AN here at the respective root of unity. And this is an exceptional, which is, uh, which is computed through a theory that we don't, uh, we didn't have time to present in the course, but hopefully will be in the book this modular theory which I, which I have started and classified, this could be, this can be classified. So what you have here, so this is a higher Duncan diagram, you see. And um, uh, I will mention a little bit uh, the properties of that as needed. But here I wanted to show you so this is a Duncan diagram at the same uh, Coxeter number. Uh, what you see as the same Coxeter number is a corresponding graph AL, yes? If there are any questions, please. Uh, what you can see here, and I'll tell you why, actually there is an explanation for this. This here is an octahedron. Can you see? It's a nice octahedron viewed from the side. Yes, the, the middle thing. So this is an octahedron with wings. Uh, the wings are, of course, exactly fragments of the A graph. Yes? So if you were looking for uh, invariance in the style of uh, uh, Sure, Remember the Schur lemma? There is a Schur lemma which says that uh, basically that if you have an, uh, so if you have a home from the trivial to, let's say, two alpha, then this is the same as home from uh, to alpha tensor alpha bar, then this is the same as home from 
alpha to alpha, yes? And the home from alpha to alpha, a non-trivial one, would split alpha into pieces. So there's a lemma called Schur lemma in representation theory. We haven't uh, done it, but it's, uh, it's not that hard to do. Uh, what you do is if you have a self-intertwiner from a representation to itself, then uh, you can show if the representation is unitary that, that the, the adjoint is also an intertwiner. And then uh, uh, xi plus xi bar, and then the square is also an intertwiner and so on. So little by little you go until you find a projection which is an intertwiner. So if you have an element, a non-trivial element, a non-trivial matrix, A, then A plus A star is self-adjoint. A minus A star over I is also self-adjoint, right? So you can decompose it into two self a sum of two self-adjoint uh, elements. Self-adjoint elements, you can take uh, a uh, polynomial of it and find a projection. And the projection splits your representation into two pieces. Yes, yeah, so that's why irreducible representations have no self intertwiners. Sure? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, let me give you, uh, yes, please. Uh, wait, wait, let, let me. No, wait, so these, these uh, they gave us a microphone, so yes, yes, go ahead. Oh. It needs to be turned on, maybe. Uh, sorry. So, so um, before... Uh, it still doesn't work. Make sure that it's on. No, no. I think that normally it's off and it needs a few seconds for pairing. I'll try to speak louder. So, so, so you call this, uh, I forgot the terminology, uh, Generalized thinking diagram. So it, uh, yes. It's meant, they're meant to classify what objects? Like, like a usual thinking diagram is classified. These objects. are, uh, yes. So um, uh, the way we obtain this is uh, by, uh, uh, by tensoring. So this is a module of this AN. So once again, this, this diagram AN, this one is. Uh, SU3, SL3, at a root of unity. This is what's known as quantum group, at a root of unity. So these exist in the literature, this, this, uh, this AN, yes? And then we compute modules, so we, we find what are the graphs on which, uh, on which this AN acts. And so, so, so you mean they are classifying some modules of uh... over the over SU uh, three in this case at a root of unity, yes. So remember that our E eight was appearing as we had multiplication with a n on the with a twenty nine with the a of the same Coxeter number on E eight. And that's what we use to build the ribbon. So once again, this is very important, uh, the, the, the question that uh, uh, Chen Hao asked, yes. So what we have is, uh, is an SLN at some root of unity, and we want to find on what does it act. And I would, uh, I, I would probably, I should spend uh, maybe, uh, uh, time uh, uh, in just a while to show you exactly what's the data for that. So the usual Dunkin diagrams are defined crystallographically from, from um, uh, simple Lie algebras, yes? You have simple Lie algebras, you find a, a special kind of basis, which are the, uh, the simple, which is a simple basis. And then you, you take angles between these, uh, these simple bases, yes? Uh, that's how you find the, the usual Dunkin diagram. We did not find them like that. What we found was that we had uh, SL2 at some root of unity, 
with a certain coxeter number n, which was measuring the number of paths, the growth of that. So if we took, for instance, SL, uh, uh, SL2 at uh, the, uh, uh, the graph A29, SL2 cutoff at the 30th root of unity, we found that it was acting on the graph E8. Remember, we made those maps from the graph AN to any graph, right? That's the one that we used. That's the same as tensoring, tensoring E8 with elements of, a, of AN, yes? So in this case, uh, what this graph has, I'm going to put, it's, it, it, there is a graph here. You can tensor with the two generators of uh, AN, which are this, uh, this generator here and this other one, which is a conjugate. Uh, that will give you the, the same graph backwards. And you need some more data which data uh, is some data which I have introduced. I'm going to put it here as some cells. So there are some numbers in these triangles. Yes, and these numbers must satisfy uh, an uh, equation. I mean, some uh, quadratic equations, which we're going to write today. And once they do that, then you know that a, that this A graph acts on this one. Yes? So let me, let me do that. But before that, uh, let's, let me uh, explain a little bit this graph. Yes? It's better to have an example beforehand. And that's a very good one. Sure, please. Let me... Previous. That thing should work. No, there is a button there, and once you turn it on, is it on? Is it on? presumably it's off. Yes, now it's on. One, two, three. I didn't touch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that still on? Uh, I suppose. Okay, I'll speak, I'll speak so, from previous lecture, you mentioned that this bottom, more complicated uh, diagram, is meant to be a higher ribbon. A ribbon in right, the right, exactly. So my question is that. So a, a ribbon is meant to be a graph. So vertices is a product of vertices of the two. two uh, exactly. But, but, but what is the rule that you assign edges of vertices? So here you see, uh, just for graphical purposes, when you make, uh, this is a crucial point. So just for graphical purposes, when you take the Cartesian product, Yes, since there's no room to make a, a usual, uh, I mean, you need uh, each of these graphs is basically two dimensional, not to mention the octahedron here, which is 3D. Uh, the, 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 both of these graphs that you see describe the Cartesian product. Yes, so you can make a Cartesian product of one with the other. Cartesian product, only a vertices. All your vertices. So the is, uh, how about edges? You yes, for the edges, um, the uh, well, you could draw the edges, but uh, but of course that would crowd the graphs. The idea here, let me show you the by uh, by harmonicity, which is the way we use the edges there, right? So you see here. So the idea is that you tensor with, uh, with a representation, which is uh, these arrows are the tensor with a standard representation here, do you see, on the AN graph, yes? And at the same time, you move one edge on, the, uh, on, this, uh, uh, on the exceptional graph, on the E5 graph. Do you see? So this is the so this is the E five graph. So look, here we ha you you have your answer in a way. We start from this corner. Do you see this corner? Yes. So we start with the one here, and then we tensor it with a generator. So you see on the graph uh, E five, we arrive at the neighbor, right? 
So, yeah, the, we should view, uh, view it as an edge. Thank you, exactly. That answers your question, yes? So we should view it as an edge between this one and this one, yes? Yes, it's actually the product of the two edges. Do you see? So there should be an edge also between he from here you have three edges, do you see, inside the star. Uh, actually, you, you have uh, one, two, uh, and three is this way, do you see? They are all together six, one, two, three. If you follow the arrows, which is a little bit hard to see. So if you follow the arrows, you have one from here, two and three from this vertex, yes? And you see if we are uh, somewhere in the middle, we also have one, two, three on the other graph, yes? So the product of these edges uh, would be the edges of this ribbon, yes? If we wanted to draw them. So what you do is you advance by one, um, think of it as a map, uh, Chen Hao, yes? You have a map in your car, yes? And, and you, you drive uh, five miles uh, on the road and you also move five miles on your map. Yes, that's the that's way you advance here. Before you say more detail, I mean, uh, uh, more, uh, another two conceptual question. And how about in the... Uh, in the simple case, there is a model by Z2 and words that Z2 correspond to in, in, in this higher, higher... Uh, yes. Uh, in this case, uh, <coughs> this one is tripartite. So, um, uh, so you see, the, so the, these are tripartite. You could color them uh, in three colors. Can you see here? And... Uh, and if, this, if we have this one here, for instance, yes, there wouldn't be a one at the same place. Uh, if, so if we advance with an edge on the graph AN, we advance an edge also here. So this would keep a, a parity fixed. But when I have defined the ribbon last time, I have defined it as a full ribbon in which we did not factor out the parity. We let that factor by itself because for SL3 there are some graphs which are not tripartite. So there you don't have this anymore. Yes, so the, the, that, you see, if you, uh, if you are on a graph paper, yes, let's, let's take the simplest example. You are on a graph paper in elementary school. Yes, and if you move one edge horizontally in any direction, and at the same time one edge vertically, then you move only on diagonals, yes, and you do have a parity. Your graph separates into two, evens and odds, yes? See, so something similar here. Yeah, simple answer is there, there is no, no, this is Z mod two things here. In, in this it case. would be Z mod three. It would be Z mod three. I did not show, well, here we couldn't show the edges. They would be just uh, too complicated so to show. I didn't show that. However, there is a, a graph. Uh, uh, so look, I, I just found this graph. And uh, uh, if I, uh, let me see here just a bit. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, look for uh, something. Yes, uh, okay. So here, here, is, here are some uh, roots which you can see, look. And let me, so first of all, so this is a poster. The other one was a, was a working, uh, was a working uh, file for myself. So I have a few hundred such working files for the theory. Uh, look, here you have the graph D, 
which is the usual graph D over, over SL2, for which the ribbon is written in the same way as, as uh, I mean, the Cartesian product is done the same way as, uh, as uh, we do it in the higher case. Can you see? We take a copy of the graph D4. Can you see the graph D4? Yes. And we put it at every point. Do you see? This is on the left-hand side. And then, you, if you start from here, you see you, you go to the neighbors. So the graph D4 has a parity, so this one would not appear here. Can you see? This point where my, my cursor is. Yes, because we must move one on the graph and one on the AN graph. So do you see this is a product AN times a graph D4, yes? And we move one edge on the graph D4 and we move uh, one edge on AN. So this is a root of D4. You see the inner product with the other roots. Yes? And as you can see here, I have uh, made uh, red points, thick red points. Uh, for the half of the ribbon here, which does, which, which does occur, yeah? The reason is that if you move one down or up, you must move one down or up on the other graph, yes? So what would appear is the uh, is a Cartesian product over Z mod 2. Now, if, you, if there was a graph ADE, the usual graph ADE, which was not uh, which was not bipartite, then, then uh, this big ribbon would not separate into two. Yeah? Now look here at the same graph for uh, SL3. This is exactly this exceptional that we are talking about. And in this graph, as you can see, the points that do appear are singled out in thick red. Yes? So, so here, what you see here is, uh, should be now uh, uh, possible to understand. You have here one vertex of this graph. Do you see this one? And you have the inner product of this particular root. So this Cartesian product will be just like for SL2. These would be the higher roots. Yes? So this particular... Now, you remember the formula. This is what I, I wanted to do. Uh, I probably do next time, because today we have to spend a little bit more time on this. Yes, so remember the formula for the, uh, in the case of SL2, for finding the inner product of a root with other roots. We took the fusion and we summed it in the two directions, going up and going down, yes? So here we are working with SL3. So you take the fusion and you sum it, as you can imagine, in how many directions? Well, these uh, are these uh, uh, vial cones, yes, which are called the vial chambers. And there are, as you can see, six of them, yes? The cones at 60 degrees, yes? So you take fusion from here downwards, you see this way, then sideways and so on, and you sum it in the six directions. And you will find that the inner product, since you start with the same one, yes, this is the inner product of the root with itself. So what's the length of the root here? square root of six, yes, which is exactly the order of the vial group of SL3. Yes, so you have six vial chambers, and you take the fusion, you sum it in the six directions, and you get this, these numbers, which are the inner products. So you see, you have here, this period here, has all the roots on one third of the full ribbon. The graph is tripartite, so it separates, the ribbon separates into three. Yes, since you move uh, one edge on the ribbon and one edge on the graph. Yes, so if you have, as I said, just imagine you're in elementary school 
that you had a uh, you had a graph paper like this. You had a piece of graph paper, and now every time you moved here, so you see this graph was going back and forth. This one back and forth, and uh, similarly for the vertical. Yes, and now every time you made one move. You would, uh, you would make a move on the other graph as well. Yes, so you can see that all the moves would be exactly on these diagonals, and then the thing would separate into two. Into two, uh, two components, yes? Right? So uh, that's, that's the case in general, yeah? So the, this, this part is not uh, actually so important. However, what is important and what we should emphasize is that um, uh, these, uh, these modules were found by a procedure called uh, conformal inclusion at level zero by physicists, by nuclear physicists from Paris, Zuber and Di Francesco. So this graph was known. There's also uh, Zhang Wei Liu found uh, two trans, uh, two series that go for air, all the SLNs, so all the higher ones. The star is part of them. And um, uh, however, the, 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 uh, the physicists tried without uh, success try to imitate the usual way to, so they knew they had something that looked like a higher Dunkin diagram, yes? So they tried to use it as a Dunkin diagram, namely to take, to, to uh, make uh, angles from the edges. Yes, an edge would mean an angle of 120 degrees or something, so. <coughs> And that did not succeed at all. So uh, the ribbon worked. And they, they were almost uh, incredulous when they, they saw this, that the ribbon just gave a, a, a Euclidean, uh, a Euclidean uh, system of roots. The theorem is exactly like the one for SL2, namely that you have the span of the fusion. The span of the fusion is, uh, consists of biharmonic functions, yes? Uh, and uh, the projection of the Dirac mass of just one unit vector, one point here, on uh, the uh, span of fusion, yes, uh, gives you exactly uh, this geometric root, which has the inner product is computed then by simply adding fusion in six directions, yes? So what you see here is a higher root lattice. Every, uh, every higher root has, if we work here over SL3, has length square root of six. Yes, so it's not a, uh, it's not uh, on the usual lattices list. Uh, I don't know of any, right now, of any way in which uh, this could be done by reflections of any kind, maybe a generalized reflection or so, but uh, uh, so uh, in any case, uh, we have, however, inner products. And as you'll see in the, um, you see there is an AN case in the AN case, uh, the usual AN case, yes, matrices, roots are not abstract. They are HIJs, yes? They're concrete vectors, zero everywhere, and the plus one and the negative one, yes? And that's what we're going to construct here as well, the high HIJs. So these would, these would have, in the case AN, uh, actually, A, B, C, D, this would have a very concrete, uh, concrete uh, construction, which gives exactly these inner products. Yes? So you see this suggests, but here uh, there's, no, uh, there's no such vector, but in the case A and there is, 
this suggests that we should find a vector which has six components, yes, plus and minus one. So that when you take the inner products, it will give you exactly these numbers. So the point once again is that, uh, well, here this is one root which is located in a corner. One should make a similar table for one root located in, uh, on the octahedron, the rest would be symmetric, yes? So this is just the inner product of a higher root with all the others. Yeah? That's what we have here. That's what you see. So, and uh, once again, it's obtained by taking the sum of the fusions. Now, here you can see six, uh, you can see this uh, rhombus. Uh, please look. This, you can see this rhombus singled out. And let's look again at the D4. Do you see here, you can see two adjacent levels. You remember that the roots of D4 the simple roots were that if you took two adjacent le levels, the inner product, as you can see, of this root, the center one, yes, with each of these three, is plus one, right? And with, uh, so, so if you take the negatives, which would, uh, you, you go a little bit low, uh, I mean, at the opposite side for one of these two, then you get the usual simple roots, yes? So these are the simple roots except for a sign on these two levels. So the basis, the, this space of biharmonic functions for the graph D4 is four-dimensional. That's how it was originally found in representation theory, yes? Now, the same statement here is that the... Uh, uh, the, uh, these, the roots in this uh, highlighted uh, rhombus, three by two, these roots are a basis. So all the others are, uh, can be written uniquely in terms of these six. And uh, as you can see, since each of them here is the, uh, is the, uh, the original graph over, over uh, three, yes? So you see we have the original graph times two here. Once again, can you see here there are a third of the vertices in each, on each side? If we take the full ribbon, the full ribbon gets rid of the parity problem, so it has uh, three components exactly of this kind, uh, three sheets which do not communicate with each other. So the inner product between the three sheets are zero. So in that case, since here you get two copies of the graph, the general theorem is that uh, <coughs> if you take the full ribbon, once again, the full ribbon is a Cartesian product, not taken over something, yes? So you see the full ribbon here. Uh, oh, this is, uh, the colors are almost uh, invisible. So, so the full ribbon here would be obtained taking, taking uh, both components. Yes, both the white and the red. So here it would be three copies. And the general theorem is that the dimension for the full ribbon is the number of vertices of the graph times the uh, order of the, vial, of the underlying vial group. I'm going to use the name subjacent. It's very seldom used in, uh, in the English language, but it is an, an English word. Uh, it was in fashion, according to Google, around 1830 or so. Now it's, now it's a bit out of fashion, uh, which is just ideal to revive it for math. So, um, uh, so we have a Euclidean, uh, a Euclidean uh, uh, 
space with elements with roots, which are vectors of length root six, and they have integer inner products with each other. And the thing is invariant to translations. Can you see here? The whole picture is invariant to translations in the three directions, right? So you see, you can, so those translations will appear in the, in the theory, and they are the high analogs of the Coxeter element, the, the translations, yes? Remember that on the, uh, on the usual ribbon, we had the translation by two, and actually on the uh, full ribbon, we have a translation by one. So you see, if you translate here by one, this one, you arrive at, uh, in this direction, you arrive at a non-root, but you will be on the other component, on one of the other components of the ribbon, yes? Now let us check for some, something like this. Let us check the, uh, the biharmonicity so that, uh, uh, so, uh, Let's take a non-trivial example here. Uh, so we go from a point, it should be checked actually for, for a point which is uh, not on the ribbon, but which has uh, neighbors on the ribbon. So uh, we should magnify it. It should be something like uh, this one, do you see? Uh, no, the, maybe uh, let's try one which is not, which is non-trivial. I mean non-zero maybe. So from here, you can go to uh, look this point. Do you see this point here? So we should. Uh, uh, you see the point with my cursor. The neighbors on this graph are the following, you, you go by arrows, yes? It's negative one, negative one, and one, yes? So the sum of the three neighbors is negative one, yes? Once again, for this point, one, negative one, down, negative one, diagonally down, yes? And now you take this same point and uh, you, uh, you go backwards on the graph, and look, if you go here to the neighbor, you get zero. If you go here, you get negative two. And if you get here, you get one, yes? Can you see? It's this point here. If you go down, it's one here. It's negative two here and it's zero here. So that the sum would be one, yes? It would be uh, negative one. So it's negative two plus one. And on the graph itself, the sum going forward is negative one, negative one, and one. Any questions? So this is the biharmonicity, the sum for a generator on the graph it depends a little bit on how the graph, I think, uh, uh, one can arrange. One of them should, be, uh, should use a conjugate of the other. So again, this comes out of associativity. What we have is home. From uh, sigma i tends alpha to sigma j tends uh, a generator, sigma one, let's call it, tends uh, beta, yes? And if we put the parentheses this way, sigma j tends uh, sigma one are the neighbors of j. Yes, remember how you tensor with sigma one, you, you just uh, move, uh, the, you put the, uh, the weights of sigma one, right? And if you put the parentheses the other way, then these are the neighbors of beta on the graph. Yes? So uh, this biharmonicity was, uh, was everything that we used in, in building, uh, 
in building the usual uh, Lie algebras and, and, and all that. So this works in general. Yes? No. Yes. So bring which one? Shrink it, yes. Exactly. This is a periodic condition. Yes, this is actually a torus. It is actually a torus, and it is uh, exactly a uh, polyhedral decomposition of a torus, uh, just as you say. So what you can see here, this, this uh, edge, yes, is glued to this edge, yes? But look at it, the root which was here is now twisted, yes? So we have a twist here, which is exactly the twist that's known in representation theory. Remember that the graph AN was twisted when we glued, uh, when we went to the negative of the ribbon, yes? And now in the last, uh, sure, go ahead. Right. Yes, yes, without details. That's a, that's, a good, uh, that's a good question. So what we are going to build is uh, we are building now the higher roots by analogy, as you can see. Then we build the higher uh, HIJs in the AN case, uh, the higher roots in a concrete way, the, the elements HIJ, which are some nice permitohedra, and so, uh, so this is... Uh, right, right, exactly. Almost everything, yes. Yes. In, 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 this kind of, in this kind of format, representation, higher representation is the representation of blocks. Right? Yes. So um, what we are going to build right after, yes, let me tell you. So uh, we're going to build first a diagonal of the higher matrices. So this is a diagonal of the usual matrix, matrices, yes. So this is uh, SLN over SL2, yes, if we do math over SL2. This is a diagonal, and our higher diagonal will be something like this. This is uh, a diagonal, so higher diagonal over SL3. Yes, so the, the higher diagonal will be uh, a, uh, uh, a period of the weights, exactly the kind of period that you see here. Yes? And then, for this higher diagonal, we're going to build matrix units. Matrix units will consist of pairs, just like the usual matrix units, E, I, J, yes? I and J are two points on this higher diagonal. They, <coughs> they will have uh, a priori nothing special. Uh, they will be just, uh, uh, just matrices. And in fact, since you have uh, two directions, you could view them as tensors. However, the very non-trivial part is the substitute for the uh, adjoint. So instead of having the adjoint, which is, uh, which is an action of Z mod 2, in this higher case, we have an action of, uh, of uh, the vial group of SL3. So we'll have an action of S3, 
uh, which is very non-trivial. Uh, we have, I have scoured the whole uh, literature and could find nothing uh, remotely analogous to it. And um, so this, there are two generalizations of the adjoint. The one is uh, uh, two goes to three, and the other is two goes to two factorial goes to three factorial. So the vial group and the and the coxet element. Now, what this higher, the way you should think about this higher involution, the higher version of the involution, is like a very non-trivial Fourier transform. You see, if you're given the real line, uh, just with pointwise multiplication as a set, yes, it's not particularly interesting. However, if you're also given the Fourier transform, then you, you can uh, take a function, take its Fourier transform, multiply that, take the Fourier transform back, and you'll get all the differential calculus and everything, uh, everything interesting about the real line, yes? So it will be the same in the higher case. And finally, what we're going to build is uh, actual representations of these uh, higher matrices. And for these representations, what we'll give is the way the matrix elements act. And what will happen with this uh, interesting involution so remember, in the case SL3, as I was taking the, instead of the involution, you have a permutation of three elements, yes? And now, if, uh, if I was to describe to you self-adjointness, then I would take, maybe I'll borrow your, uh, your pad here, yes? Then I would take a pad like this, and, uh, and uh, act with the, uh, uh, let's say, like in the gelfand settling you know, act, the matrix units would, would push flippers, if you remember there, from something like this to something like that. They would push EI plus one into EI, yes? That would be EI, EI plus one. So you would see it as pushing to the left. And from my side of the glass, I would, uh, you would see it as pushing to the right, I would see it as being pushed to the left, yes? So self-adjointness means that if you put your, uh, your representation on, uh, on glass, then uh, taking the adjoint of the matrix is the same as switching the two of us, yes? Now, uh, that will happen, thank you, that would happen in the higher case. Namely, uh, you will, will have the representation in a, a triangular glass pyramid and uh, having an action of the, of the uh, vial group, underlying vial group S3 will on the matrix uh, element will be the same as permuting the three observers. So there are now three observers. So uh, the, uh, the matrix units will give us instructions on how to change the vectors exactly like, like our picture of the Gilfan setting representation. If you remember, there were some elements at the basis. They were describing the representation, yes? That's a thing you buy from the, from the uh, planting uh, shop. Yes, you buy some roots. Uh, these are not those roots, but you just buy some, some vegetable roots. And then plants grow, yes? Each way of growing is a vector. And the matrix unit just bends those wires. That's how it acts, yes? So you can imagine that the same thing would happen in the higher case. You have something at the base, which will be actually a, 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 a usual intertwiner of all things. And uh, vectors would grow out of that. Now, one of the big open problems in the usual math is to understand the structure of these intertwiners, which are seriously understudied. 
you have a lot of uh, work on representations, but the uh, intertwinance of the maps of vector spaces from A tensor B to C, the things given by Krebs Gordon coefficients, yes, uh, those are available only as, as vector spaces. So in the higher case, uh, those would give the, those uh, and, uh, and some, uh, some variants of those would give uh, higher representations, yes? So our higher matrices would act on these, on these vector spaces and uh, they would transform them. Now, however, um, since, uh, oh, I should stop here, but uh, now, however, the, the, uh, in the higher case, the, the higher case will uh, be not non-associative, so the usual definitions would not work. What will work is just a direct description of what the matrix unit do. I want to say thank you. Oh, sure, 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 absolutely. Yes, yes, uh, let's, let, no, no, uh, let's leave the, or leave with the gentleman the microphone, yes. I have to test it before the, yes, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's our plan, and what you see here once again is a torus, yes, a torus, so instead of a ribbon uh, being a circle, yes, here it is a torus, and, uh, so what I found was, I remember I was walking and I, I had a very hard time figuring out, I mean, I knew I had the, the, the higher Dinkin diagrams, but finding this product was very strange. So I found it by some symmetries, by some computer simulation, and then I, I realized afterwards that it was exactly a sum of fusion in the six directions. Yes, so this is, uh, and uh, the proof basically works, so we'll give it the next time. The, the proof that we had for, for the case of, uh, for the usual case of SL2, that the inner product between roots was given by the fusion one way and the fusion the other way. So uh, this is a higher math, and the idea is that it should fill the, for, phys for physicists, it should fill the four-dimensional space-time with intertwiners. So uh, we'll have in the, uh, toward the end of the course, a physical model which hopefully uh, might open the way toward uh, something like different uh, particles. So there is room in this model even to have, uh, to have uh, maybe something like the uh, pieces of the standard model in a way in which you cannot have them in, in string theory which is two-dimensional. So the idea is to do what you do in the string theory case, but uh, to do it in, in four dimensions directly. Yes, and particles are very dependent on, their, on the ambient space. Yes, so the idea is that uh, you see if we are all in a, in a line, yes, if we are all sitting in a line, then in order to communicate with him, I would have to communicate with you. And this would be a severe restriction, yes? If we are on a surface, yes, in a two-dimensional line, it would be much easier to communicate, yes? So you'd have a, 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 a very different kind of interaction, yes? So in four dimensions, you would really have uh, a lot of interactions in a lot of directions. So that should, that should be a big change over two dimensions, yes? Remember the the so at least the I mean the the string, string theory is fundamentally correct in the sense that it's tensorial, so it has the right kind of uh, the right, right kind of mathematics, but the dimension is wrong, and so there's no room for the actual particles in it. Yes, yeah, so that's a part that we want to change here. I mean this is. Uh, so uh, here we, we want to fill the space with intertwiners and with computations. So the few, the brave who, who are in, uh, will stay to the end, will we'll uh, we'll see something uh, unusual. But you should, uh, uh, you should ask questions if you have any questions, yes? 
it's not that uh, bad, and it was confirmed. As I said, I, I had this, and then I saw that there were actual HIJs, you know, there were actual vectors which had exactly these inner products. Yes, so this is, uh, and then the, the act and all that, yeah. You should send us. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes. That's, that's very important. I will send you, this is a poster, and uh, yeah, actually I gave this poster to my friend, a physicist in, uh, in Marseille, Robert Coquereau. He was, uh, there's a center for conferences in Marseille, CIRM, maybe you heard of that. And he was the director of CIRM for a while. Anyway, he put his poster on the wall, and then, after a while, he developed uh, methods to find uh, what's called the theta function, to find the asymptotic, uh, 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 the number of uh, points that are given lattice, I mean, on this lattice, you know, at a given distance from the origin. Yes, and uh, some new formula, which are, uh, so yes, if you put this on your wall, then, uh, then you can start to compute with it. That, that's, that's a way, you see. Uh, people in, uh, I mean, medical students know this, right? They, they, uh, they pin on their curtains uh, all kinds of medical terms, yes? So here, if you put these, that's what I did, you know, that's why I have all these models. I mean, I was just having them, you know, hanging from the ceiling, and I noticed that if I didn't have models, then I wasn't finding out things. And if I had models, I was finding out things. So, so that's... Uh, okay, bye then. Thank you for recording this. Very often... The